Bonjour. Uh, my name is Eli Burschen, and uh, as the first, thank you for the nice introduction. As said, I, I lead a Google effort around anti fraud and abuse research, and uh, today I would like to talk about Gmail. Um, so, email accounts, like the Gmail one, are very valuable for attackers. Uh, many, many websites use email account for registration and also to send some privileged information to their client. This includes banks, uh, social network, e-commerce website, and of course, healthcare. And so when an attacker is able to break through an email account, he gets access to most of the user online life, which is why it's so valuable and so important to protect. Uh, Gmail has more than a decade now. We've been protecting it for over 10 years. And what we wanted to share today is some of the lessons we learned uh, while doing so. And so Gmail, <coughs> one thing which makes Gmail really hard to, to defend is scale. You always heard about big data, but why scale change the way you defend things? It changes it at least for three things. So the first one is you have very, very limited amount of margin for errors. Uh, try to think of a classifier. I want to remove bad email from my inbox. Well, if I have 1% false positive, then now I have billions of email flooding my user email. So it's not good enough. Uh, remember, we have recently announced we have more than 900 million users, and we are processing hundreds of billions of messages. So 1% is too much. Similarly, when you have hundreds of billions of messages a week, uh, we have to be very fast. We have to process a torrent of amount of data, so we have to be fast. Well, as you all know, <laughs> we have very, very good technique, but they are very slow. <laughs> we need to be very fast. So how you solve this conundrum is a daily fight. And last but not least, uh, one day, someone was very impressed that we said that, I think that was uh, Sergey who said, we have more than 1,000 people working on security at Google. Well, it turned out that as you become bigger and bigger, you attract more attackers. More attackers do not mean the same kind again and again. It just starts you move up to the world of criminal organization. And today, we faced the largest botnet, very, very highly motivated and sophisticated attacker who want to get to our inbox for various reasons, commercial reasons, uh, state reason, and those guys are really, really going after our account. So we have to keep growing the team and keep building new and new defense again and again. And we do iteration after iteration. Uh, so this is why scale is so hard. Scale is so hard for those three reasons and many others. So we defend Gmail against a plethora of threat, but the five one which are always coming back, we are always coming back to our malware. We don't want our user to be infected. Account security, account hijacking. You don't want our user account to be breached in two because, as we said, this is a kingdom to their online life. Um, phishing, we don't want to be a platform for other services to be compromised. Web front-end security, and in particular, uh, XSS, which we believe is a plague, and we should absolutely have as little as possible, of course. And finally, of course, spam. We don't want, you want the inbox to be clean and people to have only the email they care about and not the rest. So these are the five. Uh, threat, we always come back and we try really hard to mitigate. Um, so <coughs> let's start with an anecdote. Um, in 2011, we launched a login challenge. So a login challenge is this idea that even if you have the right login and password, we might ask you an extra question if we're not quite sure it's you. So it's a risk analysis based, and we are erring on the side of being cautious, like it may be not you. You come from a weird location, a weird device. We will ask you, well, what is your email recovery address, and what is your or what is the city you usually logged in, right? Try to assert it's you by asking extra knowledge. Well, the first lesson that we really want to drive home is <laughs> if you do that, your attacker will react almost immediately. So we've been monitoring phishing kits against Google for a while, and then almost immediately we saw phishing kit phishing, as you can see on the slide, for this exact question. So they changed the phishing kit and they're like, oh, you asked for this question. Fine, I'll just fish for it. And so this is the first question. You can never stop running. You write, you design a new technique. The technique will be under attack, and they will find a way. They will find a way in an unexpected manner, so you have to keep a pulse on your attackers, and you have to be willing to keep going at it. And security is an ongoing battle. You never win. You just work hard to stay on top, and this is what we do. Uh, the second thing we learned very early on is there is no silver bullet. Uh, so we recently announced uh, that we passed 99.9% .9 accuracy at flagging spammy email, but we don't do that with one technique. Actually, no technique will reach the accuracy we want. What it did was 
we used our large linear machine learning classifier, which was the base one, and then we added more and more technique. We used reputation, we used rules-based system, and we recently launched a deep learning classifier based on TensorFlow, which is a framework we just released publicly, and this helped us to get to where we are. But we don't stop there. Remember, attackers are getting better, so we're already working on the next generation because we know that the current stack is today where it should be, but tomorrow it will not be, so we're already working at the next generation of uh, systems. So no silver bullet combined techniques. Um, even if accuracy is a very great metric, it's not telling you the full story. Your classifiers need to be tuned to your product. For example, on the Gmail case, a user will be very upset if one of the good email end up in the spam folder because it will never show up in his inbox. It's very costly. You expect a mail from your boss, from your wife, and then you don't see it, and then you know dispute on you. Whereas if we put a spam email into your inbox, well, you are a little bit annoyed, but you can just report it as spam, and it's gone. So the cost is not the same, and so the classifiers need to account for those trade-offs. Of course, you need to keep both in check, but you can skew it one way or another. For your product, it might be completely different. Uh, for instance, the cost of letting a hijacker go through an account is way higher than just asking a login challenge. So, so for a login challenge, we actually do the complete reverse. But so tune your classifier such that it reflects your priority of your product, and that's something we strive to do. And then, forget about pride, about ego. You will make mistakes. We do. And, but we know about it, so we create catch-up mechanism. We know that sometimes we will miss something, but we want to be able to mitigate this by having catch-up mechanism. One of them, uh, the most visible to our user, is this red banner. So the mail was received, and we didn't catch right away. It was a phishing email, because we didn't detect properly the page was a phishing page happened. So in that case, we had able, after the email was delivered, to put this red banner and say, hey, we're wrong. Sorry, it's a bad email. Don't click on it. Don't click on it. And it helps us to catch up. So assume you will make mistakes, make it part of your, your, your process, and just have catch-up mechanism. Really important. Similarly, your user are your best ally when it comes to security. These are your spam fighter, your, your fraud fighter. They can really help you if you give them the right tool to do it. So provide, empower your user to help you fight abuse by providing them meaningful UI and meaningful tools. For example, we do it for end user. Uh, we have offered for a very long time the ability to do uh, report spam and phishing, and we recently added the ability to block a sender or to also unsubscribe directly with one click. Similarly, for, par for the sender of email, uh, we provide dashboards so they know how well they're doing, how much we spam folder, and so forth, so they can improve their practice. Um, it turns out that the unsubscribe button has an interesting backstory. The unsubscribe, early on, we had only report spam and phishing, and we discovered that people would actually use the spam report button uh, for email who they subscribed before, maybe a mailing list or a social network, and that they don't want to see it. So what are they doing? Well, they not unsubscribe. What they do is they click on spam, 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 and as a result, we end up clamping a good sender that people are tired of, and spammers into the same bucket. And remember, the reputation is something which Gmail uses a lot to decide spamming or not spamming. How many of you have reported a commercial email as spam? Come on, raise your hand. Oh, yeah, here you go. So for all of you, you probably don't want that, because you have to click multiple times on report spam before we do it. So we provide you a new option, which is block the sender or unsubscribe. It tells us it's not spam, it's just I don't want to see it. Please get it away, rid of it. So it's good for the end user. It's immediate feedback on what you want. It's also good for the sender, because they are not clamped together with Spammer again, so they have all the incentive in the world to implement this feature. That's why it has been such a huge success in both ways. You provide something meaningful to people, and they're able to self police themselves. Um, use of overwhelming force. Might seem abstract, it's not. Remember, adaptive adversary means they're going to probe through your system. They're going to test this, test that, how it reacts. So when you change your system and you, want, you, you put a fix, don't put one at once. Put multiple at once, so it's harder for them to figure out what changed. Especially if you have code, then they can look at the code, and they can figure out exactly what lines change. So if you, change, if you have a huge patch with thousands of lines, it's harder for them to understand what you change. So it makes you make your life harder. So don't release patches one at a time. Clump them together and do a three-week cycle or a weekly cycle, or even if you're Microsoft, a monthly cycle. But don't do it one at a time. It's too easy for them. Um, I would like to focus a little bit on email attachment. Email attachment is something which is its own beast by itself. Uh, we process billions of documents uh, every day. And so 
So the first thing which is important to understand about attack is attack do not come as a steady flow. You don't have 20 attackers knocking on your door every day. You have nothing, then you have 100, and then you have 100 million, and then you have nothing. These are busts. And to show you really what it looks like, this is directly taken from monitoring services. This is three months of data from the end of 2015. And as you can see, the important thing is the spike. Sometimes we see 40 times more malware on a given day than the day before. So attack come in burst. They have a new idea, and they just try to bombard your user with it, and then you defeat it, and then come back. So it's planned for this huge burst. Uh, it's not a steady system. It's a bursty system, and it actually influences deeply how you should build your system. For example, when we process uh, data, the first rule we have, do not process twice. Processing malware and documents is very expensive. And remember, at billion scale, we can't process that much. We have to be very fast. So we never ever process things twice. We use storage, which is cheap, to ever to record every decision we make. And in some cases, when we have this huge outbreak, it saves us up to 50% of the competition we do. Then hindsight, this was probably the smartest decision we made. I didn't make it, but the person who made it was really, really smart. Uh, they had discussion about how Gmail will look like, right? It was 2004. And someone say, why would we authorize executable? What's the rationale? Do we really have a business case of exchanging executable to email? Uh, probably not. And it won't hamper the, the use of the product. And remember, it's easier to not deploy a feature than to take it over from the user. User gets really upset. If you remember the PlayStation 3 example where they remove Linux, people were really upset. Taking away from people is really hard. So ask yourself beforehand, do you really need this? Is it really something you want for your product? It turned out that we don't want executable. It's really hard. I mean, honestly, there is packers. There is all those obfuscation techniques, testing services. It would have been miserable. So by policy, we don't have executable, so we're fine. And actually, no one complained about it at this day. So I think it was one of the smartest decisions. Having, when you do design, Always ask yourself, do I need it for my business purposes? If I don't, I'm opening an area of attacks. Do I really want to live with the rest of my life with this? Maybe, maybe not. But it's worth actually thinking about that. And we reject a ton of things because of this. Um, <clears throat> the second thing is, even if you use the same technique, you can use multiple implementations of it. So antivirus is a great example where we rely on many antivirus together. Uh, we use ensemble learning. Ensemble learning states that if you have an engine which is above 50%, by combining multiple of those, you get a greater accuracy uh, than using one. So use multiple antivirus to protect Gmail, so you can do the same. It's not only use different techniques, it's also within the same technique, use different implementation, because they would have different results. Um, last but not least, uh, that's one of the most known questions we get, is how do we deal with things which are undetected? First, they are very, very rare and few, but they do exist. And they are either mutation of, a new, of an old thing that people have mutated so it bypasses antivirus and all our system before this one, or because they are completely new. Again, very, very rare, but we have to catch those. And to do that, we rely on dynamic execution, which is running the document in a fully, on, fully environment. This is extremely costly, so we can't only do it for a few, few documents, and we have a complex system to decide which one. But this is how we deal with the undetectable uh, malware Last but not least, um, implement emergency blocking system. How many of you heard about Black Swan? Well, only very few people. OK, so Black Swan is a theory by Nassim Taleb, uh, which says the thing which hurts you the most is not what you plan for, but what you have not, you cannot predict. There is no point of trying, you just can't. Like a market crash. Uh, you want to go to the office, and then the guy in front of you died of a heart attack in the, in the freeway. You, you can't predict that, and it affects every aspect of our life. An unpredictable thing is this thing that you can't. There is no prediction possible for that, and you have to account for that. What you know is unforeseeable bugs, unforeseeable attack will actually hit you, so you have to have a process, and you have to have an emergency big button you can push and stop. Understand what is happening, correct, and then resume. Uh, I'm going to give you a concrete example. Remember, we don't authorize the executable, so we're fine. Well, someone, very, very clever, uh, realized that we authorized LNK uh, file at, at some point, which is a link file. A link file turned out you can actually run executable with it by uh, launching the shell command, which is already on Windows, and they come up, decide to have a very, very clever attack. 
we didn't force in it. We didn't even saw that link could be used to exploit our user. It turned out it can. So we actually push a red button, say, stop. What's happening with the NK? We stop the traffic. We look at what was happening. And then we resume having the defense in place. As a result, no more LNK on, Win on Gmail. No one complained, except maybe the bad guys. So that's one of the examples of those black swans where we didn't force in it. And then we had to react. And we were glad to have a uh, black swan process. OK, guys, it's 2015, 16. Encrypt everything. Encryption is cheap. Encryption is fast. Uh, we worked last year, for instance, to change it on mobile device to make it even faster. No reason. Encrypt data in transit, encrypt data at rest. You cannot talk about security if you, don't ha if you don't have encryption. Encryption is a foundation. Whatever you build, which I don't have encryption, is building a castle in the sand. It's going to collapse. So we really want that. You, you should have data encryption. Um, we were one of the early adopters of, of data encryption in transit for email in 2010. And then in 2014, piggybacking on, my, uh, on the previous talk, we try to nudge people to use it by releasing a transparency report. We show you exactly how much traffic we see uh, encrypted. As today, we have about 62% of our inbound traffic, which is encrypted, and about 82% outbound, which is encrypted. It's double from when we launched the transparency report. So yes, trans public pressure works, but that's not enough. We want to be at 100%. And understanding why we cannot reach us 100% is really important because we want that. It's the same thing as HTTPS. Why is no one running HTTPS? Why, why is there still in transit data that are not encrypted in 2016? That's a big problem. Um, be metric driven. Uh, it's good for you. It's good for you on the long run because you get a sense of progress. If you don't have metrics, it's really hard to know where you are and how much you have traveled and how much you need to travel. It helps you to find a pinpoint and maybe also even show to your boss you're doing a good job, right? Uh, for Gmail, one of the key metrics we have is the number of XSS which are affecting our front end because we believe XSS is the most deadly attack, web attack we can have against Gmail. And so we track them quarter by quarter. Uh, what this metric show you is in 2015, in the first three quarters, we only had one XSS reported, which is way lower than what we had in 2011 or 2012. It helped our team to feel that we are making progress, that Gmail is increasingly secure, and that we are in the right direction. Uh, we thought of using SQL injection as a metric, but we don't use SQL, so that would be cheating. It would be just flat. Um, <coughs> Sometimes you need to make big bets. Um, about four or five years ago, we were discussing XSS, and we realized that one of the pain points and the difficulty is to tell engineer for engineers to figure out how to escape data. Remember, an email is usually HTML plus CSS plus JavaScript plus God knows what, and they can be combined in any order. And so it's really hard for an engineer to figure out how am I going to escape this piece of content. And so it's the human is course of errors. And then uh, you have to teach people of doing it, and they are reluctant to do it because they have to ship the feature in time and so forth. So really bad idea. So we beat the bullet, and we're like, OK, we need something better. Let's build a new technology and we build auto-escaping. And auto-escaping is basically, as you can see on the slide, you say, escape my document, and then the compiler do all of it. It's a great technology, but as the talk before said, it's extremely costly to implement. It actually took our security team one year and a half to migrate all our code. Uh, you probably use Gmail today. Uh, some of you might be even typing as I speak. But we also have the legacy front end, and we also have inbox, and we have many, many, many front ends. So retrofitting security in all of them was a huge effort. But we believe it was worth it because sometimes the best way to prevent bug is to change the software design to accommodate with this new idea, and some ideas are worth pushing. And we believe that auto escaping for template is the way to end most of XSS bug. You don't have to worry about escaping. You don't have your team on the long run is better off because they don't have to sync and write this code. Uh, you can execute faster. It takes a year and a half, but then you pay upfront costs, and the dividends are really worth it. So that's one of the story. Um, similarly, one of the big endeavors we did was uh, launching CSP as a blocking system for Gmail. We wanted to do that as defense in depth. So CSP is when it's secure content policy, content security policy, which is a browser directive which says which script from which origin you can include into the pages. And we wanted to have that to mitigate XSS, because then you cannot include the script, which is controlled by the attacker. It's not in the whitelisted domain. Uh, by doing so, we actually believe we, believe we helped uh, keeping Google inbox secret. 
Google, Google Inbox was CSP compliant from the day one. And when we released it to Alpha Tester, we realized that some of them had malware on the computer. And what the malware would do, it would inject JavaScript into Inbox, and then CSP would block it. And we believe that this prevented a lot of exfiltration, which could have led to a potential leak. Also, by refactoring our code, it forced us to think of, why do I have this JavaScript? Why do I do that? And then we found a bunch of potential XSS in our code that we removed. So it not only has this layer of depth of doing what it do, but also a side benefit that we found very valuable. So all in all, view your product as a castle. You need as many different as you can. Uh, for instance, have deep learning, encryption, antivirus. Uh, one other one we need to mention is fuzzing. Fuzzing is really, really useful. It gets rid of a ton of stupid bugs. Uh, we provide our uh, fuzzing framework, AFL, publicly. You can use it or any other fuzzer. Just fuzz your system. It costs you a few CPUs, but the downside. It works pretty well, and we found a ton of bugs like this, for instance. So defense in depth, view your product as a castle. You should do that. And then you need to man your castle. You need to have more people looking at the data. And honestly, pay for bug. It is absolutely worth it. Everyone else who tells you something else is wrong. This is absolutely the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do for two reasons. First, those guys have a different pair of, eye, pair, pair of eyes, so they will find bugs that you never saw of, and so you get a lot of interesting bugs. Secondly, it sends the right message, which is you embrace security as the ever-moving target, and you welcome people's feedback. It's responsible, and you also recognize it's a hard work, so people work hard to help you, you give them money. Why not? They help you to make your product better, and so they are part of your research team and your security team. That's great. And finally, remember, be metric-driven. Well, actually, as you can see on the graph, we get less report of vulnerability, which means it's harder for them to, to work. The reason why the payout increase is because we pay more. We pay more because it's harder, and we will keep paying more because, well, that's great. If we have to pay more but for harder bugs, that's great. We also have this whole internal metric that we look at the complexity of the report. And if you look at that, the bug report in 2010 versus 2015 has nothing to do in common. 2010, that was pretty easy. 2015, people really work hard for their money. So it's also a good internal metric that for security researcher, it's hard. So if it's hard for them, it's hard for the attacker. So that's great. It's a great confirmation metric. Uh, if you don't want to do it yourself, uh, there are plenty of companies who actually would help you to set up your bug, your reward program. So, but run one. Even if you pay a small amount, you get some people reporting it, even a user who finds a bug, and they should be rewarded for that. So key challenge, briefly. The key challenge we have is dynamic rendering. As the world becomes more complex and browser becomes more complicated, we see an increasingly sophisticated phishing pages and spam email who use JavaScript, CSS, media queries, uh, browser fingerprinting to be able to uh, show a different view to Gmail and to the user, so we have to reconcile those uh, permanent all the time. So dynamic rendering is complicated. Hack website, as we said, reputation of the sender is really important for us. So when a site is hacked, we have to react very quickly. It's also really hard to reach to those people that have been hacked. Email security standard, it's really hard to get things adopted. We have authentication standard. We have encryption standard. We're not at 100% for things that everyone agrees should be done. And how to find the pain point and how to help people to get them adopted is really important. It's through education and talking and helping people, and we really want them to be adopted, like we want HTTPS to be adopted. Uh, and finally, because I know you guys like scary story, uh, yes, we do see advanced phishing attacks. Uh, we see very, very clever attacks which target very few users. One of them, for instance, was the OO token attacks, where instead of phishing for the user login and password, they ask the user for delegation of all tokens such that they can read uh, Gmail content. And it's really harder for the user because this is not the usual thing they would check. So it's very rare case, but yes, a uh, sophisticated attack we see. Um, key takeaway in case you fell asleep during the talk or is three. First, combine technology at each layer. As we said, different technology, but also more of the same. If they are differently implemented, will help you to be stronger. Secondly, different in depth, which means keep at each component, a layer of defense, but also have catch-up mechanism and have a, an emergency system, which is like if something, everything goes wrong, you have a way to save something. And finally, having, you are as strong as your security team. And your security team means the people who work on security, of course, you need more of those, 
but you need also your engineer who don't work on security to help for security, because security is not a matter of one guy, it's a matter of everyone. It's also the matter of your user. Your user are part of your security team, you should build a system for them to help you. They will find spam for you, they will report you phishing pages, they will help you to figure out this unexpected thing, because, well, we have 9 mil 900 million of those, so you know they spot quite a few things. And finally, the research community is your team. Pay them. If they find a bug, if they have an idea on how to help your product, well, that's great. It's great. You can't have any of it. So that's for your security team. And you should be very welcoming every bug as a positive contribution and not react badly to them. You should be grateful for those. So those are the secret, which we believe is really the essence of what we believe is making a strong product. So thank you very much for uh, listening to the talk. And if you have any questions, I will take those.